Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here. So just in case any of you might be laboring under the delusion that I am not certifiably insane, thought I might make a video just to just to disprove that notion once and for all, make my way into a Mr. Medicare Internet Insanity Hall of Fame video, and have a real stream of consciousness here, because this may be the nuttiest thing I've that's that's sparked me yet. So to help I'm go be, me be a tiny bit more professional. I'm going to give you the thesis, the TLDR version, right up front before I go down my crazy train of thought and lose my train of thought. So you have the idea, and then you can check out when I start to ramble about everything else I'm thinking about. So TLDR, Marvel, SJW Marvel artists, and comic book artists and comic book writers in general need to go outside more there it's duh duh now now i'm gonna ramble because really my point is why i got sparked thinking about this and how my imagination started the, the wheel started turning that 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 really substantiates the point a bit so here i go so i'm walking home and i see a plant and i see a uh, spoke uh, for tomato plants and i see a spider web waving from the plant and i it catches the light, it's beautiful. You know, I couldn't even film it because it probably wouldn't capture on an iPhone and it's too close to my house. But, uh, so you're just gonna have to imagine it. It's so weird. But, uh, it, so I, I, was, I was mesmerized by how beautiful this waving spider web was. I started thinking about the spider and the beauty of the nature. Spiders tend to start me thinking about Spider-Man and what the character means to me and then things started falling together. So one of the reasons this spider web was unusual was the gap between the plant and the the tomato vine spoke was about three or four feet and the spider had clearly attempted to we leap or weave a web between these two things at such an enormous distance and had failed. It either failed to make it or it had its web had been broken and now the web is wobbling wildly in the wind and I started thinking about this almost as a metaphor that the spider had failed to make its web somehow yet the memento of that attempt was there the almost kind of creepy idea that if a spider wanted to it probably could jump right at your face from a distance of three or four feet and I love spiders but all, all bets would be off if one was ever suicidal enough to try that and uh, I started thinking about my own characters, my own comics, and you know, gee, what if I had my character sit down and look at a spider web and use that as a metaphor of failure, but taking hope in spite of failure. I, I, I think about those things a lot, and sometimes something in nature will spark the idea of a character moment. So one of my characters, she killed a spider when she was young because she was scared of spiders, and this has affected her psychologically for the rest of her life. It's one of her earliest childhood memories and then spiders become important to kind of like the sci-fi action element of the story I imagine when I go into my imaginary world but uh, I don't know I don't want to talk too much about my, my my personal projects here I want to talk about general application of creativity so then I started thinking about spider-man and thinking well you know Spiders as a metaphor for something that'd be even better in a spider-man comic and sometimes I'll you know dream up little story ideas about characters I love and Dream wouldn't it be cool to write stories about them, but then I'll really use those ideas for my own Creative works even if the germ of it came from spider-man or Batman. So now I'm thinking about spider-man again Right see see how the gears are wor whirring it starts as one little spider while I'm out on a walk and now it, I'm thinking about Spider-Man and what the character means to me. Uh, when I was a little kid, my parents got me this weird CD box set of PDF scans of old Spider-Man comics. And so they included the ads, you know, the printing errors, everything. It was, I, I don't know if this was legit or not. It seemed legit. It seemed, I think it had Marvel's name on the box, but you would read PDF scans of the entire Amazing Spider-Man run from from Amazing Fantasy 15 up to the 90s. So. I, as a teenager, read most of Spider-Man, the Amazing Spider-Man's decades-long history. I had, you know, a collection of '90s comics from my old, my, from my old man and my older bro that I would read, and I'd re sometimes go to the library and read some of the newest stuff. But I had a pretty exhaustive knowledge from the '60s up to 
the 90s and it reintroduced me to the character and reinforced my love for the character where I was a little kid and he was a cool superhero and he's got a fun costume and he catches bad guys and then as a teenager reading the thrust of his whole story get, Zach's talked about this he had gravitas he had pathos he's one of the best super, he, I think he's the best superhero ever created. As much as I love Batman, Superman, the Justice League, especially when I was a little kid, the Marvel Universe was Sp Spider the Spider-Man company and some cool superheroes who would hang out with Spider-Man who were also kind of cool. And that's not a dig or a diss on Marvel's other he heroes. It's just an observation about how I thought about it as, as a little kid. Spider-Man was the hero I loved and I was interested in these other Marvel heroes based on the fact that they were cool guys who hung around with Spider-Man and they go on adventures together. But Marvel was the Spider-Man company and Spider-Man was the character I loved even more than all of DC. Even though I knew more DC characters and liked more DC characters, there's this general idea that DC has kind of deeper, more symbolic heroes and Marvel has a more down-to-earth, grounded approach to heroes and I think there's truth to that but I think that Spider-Man almost almost refutes that that idea as a generally applicable principle so it's it's somewhat true but it's not true in every single way because Spider-Man does get at deeper heroic themes uh, that are in many ways more substantive and more eternal than most of the DC line where DC has the reputation of being kind of the mythological uh, high high concept company right so the and like Zach I'm kind of pained over how Spider-Man is treated recently but unlike Zach who kind of will read and roast it I had I have had so much appreciation for the character of Spider-Man that I can't even bring myself to read a new Spider-Man comic book I got a free Chip Zdarsky comic book by accident when Marvel messed up their download codes and I can't read it even to roast it or talk about the art I, I can't it's like there's something there's a little kid that lo still loves spider-man and i know that if i crack open a new comic book that that little kid's hopes and dreams are gonna die and i'm, I'm grown up so I'm, i might just have to bite the bullet and do do it sometime but ah uh, marvel the marvel doesn't get what it's what it's doing by by making spider-man a little jag off to dip wide ah uh, man okay so the imaginative process and how can marvel improve itself why do marvel artists and writers need to go outside to fix everything i'm i'm, I'm so close to going on a tangent about dan slot and my uh twitter my twitter drama with dan slot and that's too ancillary to my point so i've got to stop it but dan slot i'll just say in brief i think dan slot's poisonous behavior to the fans yeah uh, is, it, it, it doesn't speak well of his ability to write a heroic character. It's, it's true that you could write good stories and you could have, you know, be salty or be mean online and that doesn't really reflect who you are generally. I've done that, so that's why I have sympathy for Dan Slott and I don't want to be too hard on Dan Slott, but at, at the same time, Spider-Man is a character with so much pathos. You, you, you can't just imagine what heroic her, heroism and virtuism is you have to have enough moral fiber that you can write a character with moral fiber. It's just like you can't be ignorant of science and then write a character who's a scientist that convincingly because you'll just have like a Wikipedia level knowledge of what chemistry is. So I know Zach's defended Dan Slott. I, I think Dan Slott needs to go and no matter how much the rational and uh, forgiving part of me wants to forgive Dan Slott and buy a bunch of Spider-Man comics to support the company. The, the part of me that doesn't like being called a Nazi by Dan Slott when I ask when is, when is Silver Surfer coming out. That's the part that puts the, co puts the Dan Slott comic book down when I'm, when I'm making purchases. Okay, Dan Slott tangent, we gotta put that away. We gotta stay on task. So I think I know how to fix Spider-Man. And the problem is that I've been studiously avoiding Spider-Man for about 10 years ever since One More Day and I just heard friends talking about One More Day and saying, oh man, why are they doing that? He's gonna be a hero, right? He's not gonna, he's not gonna destroy his marriage with Mary Jane. He's not gonna do something so unheroic 
and then I'd hear, oh, Doc Ock is inside Spider-Man's head. What? Why, why are they doing that? They're going to fix it. I mean, it's obviously just like a, a gimmick to get people interested and... And, oh, he revealed his identity in Civil War. Oh, his identity's back now that he's erased his marriage. Oh, man, what are they doing? Okay. Okay, so I, I've seen the tweet from Tom Brevoort saying they're not going to take it back. They're not going to restore the, the Spider-Man that we love. And I think a corporate shakeup could fix that, but it may not necessarily fix it if unless the people at Marvel comic books recognize the need of bringing back this heroic character. So this is kind of dream mode, a what if, how, imagine that I'm the CEO of Disney and I have a big say in what I'd like to see accomplished. But I actually want to make it realistic enough that it, this is a feasible way of fixing Spider-Man. So the problem is, if you just like undo it, if you just undo one more day, that'd feel like a cheap cop out. So the, the way of fixing it has to recognize what has come before as a valid part of Spider-Man's history and fix it in such a way that it, it, those events happened, but we restore Spider-Man to his heroic and cool status where him destroying his marriage was one of the worst decisions of his life on par with allowing the crook to go away who ended up killing Uncle Ben. We need it. It's almost so bad that it may be unredeemable, but I think we can redeem the character and fix it. So here's my fan fiction stream of consciousness on fixing Spider-Man. Okay, so Spider-Man made a deal with the devil, erasing his marriage from Mary Jane from existence. And as far as I understand, this means that he himself seems to be unaware of his own marriage. Some people have said they actually liked the way it was executed, even if they hated the concept, because the devil appeared to Spider-Man in the form of his daughter, and the, the daughter who would have existed had he kept his marriage, and that she then disappeared from existence after Spider-Man made his dumb decision to save Aunt May and allow his marriage to be erased. And uh, so since, since sort of this weird mystical shenanigans is what is what is what is what is responsible for erasing his marriage. We need some weird mystical shenanigans to fix this. Uh, this is one of the reasons I checked out of comics. Was too much time travel, interdimensional, alternate reality, Superboy punching a hole in the universe and fixing everything in DC. Uh, guys from the future in Marvel. I don't know. The, DC seems to do it a lot with all their infinite crises, but Marvel is guilty of it too. Too much, too much reorganizing the universe to try to to try to fix something and it's it's a barrier i what i've finally learned is i just have to say in my head time travel shenanigans and then try to enjoy the rest of the story without worrying too much about whatever cosmic interplanetary time travel multi-dimension nonsense ex explains why this version of the character is here or is or is or isn't dead okay so uh we need a cosmic character like like the devil or like Madam Web or the one above all, Stan Lee. Have Stan Lee be the cosmic character or whoever it was who started Marvel Generations. So we could even tie it to Marvel Ge Generations. Some cosmic character comes to speak to Spider-Man and effectively his marriage with Mary Jane had something important to do critically with the fate of the Marvel Universe. And he, by destroying his marriage, has has thrown the entire Marvel multiverse into chaos, and he must take responsibility for his choice and correct correct his error. So uh, Spider-Man is going to go on sort of some cosmic, multi-dimensional journey. You can have some kind of shaggy dog stuff where he runs into other dimensions and runs into other versions of Spider-Man and Spider-Girl. And this could be your chance to retcon a few things, bring a few characters into the Marvel Universe. But the theme of the story is Spider-Man screwed up. Stan Lee or someone gives him a talking to. He's going to have to have a major fight crossing dimensions and crossing time to restore his marriage with Mary Jane. And by doing so, this is going to transform Spider-Man's character where some of the stuff that has happened will, will still have occurred. He still will have had, I guess, Doc Ock messing with his mind. He still will have become a billionaire, tech industry genius. He still will have been a jag-off for decades and decades of time. But uh, th this is going to be him restoring his soul effectively and the heroism that he lost when he chose, made the unheroic act of sacrificing his marriage with Mary Jane. So he'll endure great, fantastical, 
battles and circumstances, and at the end of the day, the the marriage will simply his marriage with Mary Jane will simply have been restored to what it was. I think the perfect ending would be uh, she she gives birth to his daughter as he comes back, and he is the only one who retains memory of what he did and the universe that existed where he was not married to Mary Jane. For everyone else, Spider-Man has remained married to Mary Jane this whole time. I think there was a weird time where he was divorced to Mary Jane before One More Day, but like I said, the 2000s were where I was just kind of like picking up a few at the library, so I'm, I'm a little hazy on some of my comic book continuity, but that's the thrust of the story. And then what's the continuation of the story? What's the fallout? Because we can't just go back to him back in 1990s continuity. A lot of things have happened. So here's my pitch for the new Spider-Man is he has more power, he has more financial power, he's kind of like a, he's kind of like a mini Tony Stark now that he's a tech billionaire. So now he has more responsibility. So the theme of the new wave of Spider-Man is Spider-Man's a father, he's happily married, he's successful, and he's going to be building towards having a positive effect on the Marvel world because of his view on with great power comes great responsibility. He's going to the next level with that, and he's essentially going to be kind of a father figure for all of the spider characters within the Marvel Universe. So not only can this fix Peter Parker by giving him his marriage back and making him a responsible and sensible and heroic character again, this can help the weird distaff characters and spin-off characters. Miles Morales, this can help give them all a better place in the Marvel Universe where Spider-Man is sort of Spider-Man Prime. He, he's, it's like when Tony Stark was giving Spider-Man a suit of armor and Spider-Man was kind of Tony Stark's little sidekick in Civil War, but now Spider-Man is going to be the one trying to build a network of better heroes, better equipped, better tra trained, more responsible, better equipped to save lives, and all the Spider characters will be involved with his work. And you could have some sort of mystical explanation for why this is. Ever since sort of the John Romita Jr. days, they floated the idea that the spider that bit Peter wasn't just radioactive, it was somehow magical, and this, this was a mystical destiny that he would become a, a, a spider, a spider man, almost like a spider deity, and that whole war with the, with the Morlins or whatever they were, these kind of vampire creatures in uh, Spider-Verse, the idea is they had, they needed to absorb the powers or the energies of Spider-Man. So we already have this sort of mystical backdrop to Spider-Man that can give us all the magic time travel -y shenanigans we need to change the universe. What we're focusing on is what the character will be moving forward. He will be a father figure, kind of like Batman to Batgirl and the Robins, where he's teaching young spider heroes, he's training young spider heroes, he's still going out and doing street level, neighbor friendly neighborhood Spider-Man stuff, but his goals are bigger. His experience with Dr. Octopus and the, spir and the Superior Spider-Man have given him a bigger picture of how he can have a long-term impact, saving lives and, and using his powers responsibly. So Miles Morales now is part of this network of Sp Spider-Man Inc. Uh, Silk and the various spider women. I'd even like them to bring the spider girl, uh, I think, what is it, May, May Jane Parker. I, I haven't read the popular Spider Girl alternate universe comics, but go ahead and bring her, bring her in. So she's Spider-Man's daughter from the future, and she's part of this big network of spider, spider heroes. If you want to save, I don't know, this won't, we won't need one more day anymore because the, the little niche market that wants to see Spider-Man in a happy marriage, a happy and healthy marriage with Mary Jane, now they'll be able to read the main Spider-Man book and not this kind of weird what if book of, from an alternate universe. But if you want to save Mary Jane and the daughter from that universe and bring them into this mystical spider ink, go ahead. But uh, this, is, this connects to something I've been saying about Captain Marvel. She may be an unredeemable character now that she's essentially been sp space Mussolini, but if you wanted to make a dry, military, kind of firm character likable, it's hard because they don't have much fun about them. They're no-nonsense, they're military-like, they're organized, they're 
they're competent, they're blandly competent. But the way you generally make those characters likable in a story is you make them part of a team where their leadership is necessary as glue to hold people together. So Leonardo is probably the most boring Ninja Turtle. He wants to be a good ninja. He always says, yes, Master Splinter. But he's a lot of kids' favorite Ninja Turtle because they sense that he's the leader. And he has leadership qualities Raphael lacks. And Leonardo's seriousness and his maturity holds the, t the team of immature Ninja Turtles together. Uh, Cyclops, you know, Cyclops, they kind of clown him in the X-Men movies, but Cyclops is supposed to be this mature uh, military c c strategist type of guy who holds the wacky team of the X-Men together and gives them direction and purpose. So being a leader makes you admirable, even if being the you know, goody two-shoes Boy Scout leader also gets you made fun of a bit. It's, it's, it's the Superman effect. So Captain Marvel, if, if she were fixable, you'd fix her by making her the responsible leader of a gang of kooky kids with personality problems who need to grow up and mature, and she's sort of the mother figure who teaches them valuable lessons about character and responsibility and heroism. And we come to like her not as a goofy kid who makes mistakes, like accidentally throwing people into jail without trial, but as a character who's mature and holds, holds a team together. So Spider that's Spider-Man's role now. He is holding a team of like an angry Miles Morales who goes, who's really talented, but goes off and loses his temper on the field. A Silk who's maybe kind of a little bit stressed out by her weird experience of being raised by ninjas in seclusion. All these characters, all the, the, the broader spider characters are gonna have kind of over the top personalities and over the top flaws. And Spider-Man now is a grown, more mature, more responsible business savvy person is a father figure for the whole outfit directing them and building their confidence and their skills to become a better team he's the charles xavier of the spider-man inc or team spider or, or whatever it is so i think that's the thrust of my fan fiction idea of how, how to fix spider-man uh so that i i could actually connect with the character again as the character i love and not simply just erase what's been going on with the character for the past 10 years. Keep keep some of the best bits of that through a time travel shenanigan story. But all right, so that was that was a long tangent. That was a long tangent. But the, I guess the point I'm trying to demonstrate is me going outside and seeing a spider sparked that whole train of thought. And one of the problems that Marvel has is this bubble mentality where they don't know what human beings look like, behave like, act like. They don't know about Republicans who aren't Nazis. They think Dan Slott thinks if you are a Republican, you, you must be a Nazi supporter. That's a, that's, maybe that's a little unfair to Dan Slott, but that was the thrust I got from my interaction with him, where he, after I kind of naively tried to persuade him, hey man, you know, you, you said I was a Nazi sympathizer. I'm not, I don't, I don't like Nazis. Maybe you should take that back. And I got some uh, mockery and derision back. My first response was kind of just to laugh and you know tweet, man, that escalated quickly, and I thought it was kind of funny. But I've gotten saltier about it because then he deleted the tweets, and then a little after that he blocked me, and him blocking me has almost made me saltier than him calling me a Nazi sympathizer because I asked him when does Silver Surfer come out? Because now now I'm curious, did he delete those tweets because he regretted? saying that to me? I don't think so, because then he blocked me. Did he delete them because he was scared the bosses would see them? In which case, I kind of, I kind of want Marvel to know about that one time I asked Dan Slott, when is Silver Surfer coming out? And he called, and he, in front of tens of thousands of Twitter users, said I was a Nazi sympathizer and insinuated I was a horrible person. Hmm. I, I wasn't that salty about it at first because this was just my little anonymous account to talk about comic books, and it's not like he used my personal name, but there's a person behind the screen, Dan Slott, and there's a person who buys comic books and shares comic books with kids behind the screen, and you can delete those tweets, but my memory of the conversation doesn't, doesn't go away that easy, easily. And as much as I want to just kind of forgive and forget and move on, when I go to the comic book shop and I see Dan Slott and I remember that Twitter exchange, I don't want to pay five bucks for it. Even even if the rational part of me knows that you probably won't see a fraction of a penny of my purchase, that it's hard. 
man, this, okay, so what, I, what, I, what I'm now realizing from the stream of consciousness is I'm a bit more bitter about my interaction with the onslaught than I thought I was. I thought I'd kind of move past it and it was just a little Twitter drama in the past. I laughed off, but maybe this illustrates the point that even that uh, when Zach says you have to treat the comic book industry like burgers and treat the fans with respect, this is me kind of personally understanding that and underscoring it because I can't, it's hard for me to move past it. I want to just forgive and forget and move past it and talk about Dan Slab books and talk about Spider-Man and talk about the art and look for cool stuff, but that petty part of me that doesn't like being called a Nazi, a Nazi sympathizer without evidence, it's harder, it's hard to feel like I'm justified in paying, paying him five bucks. I don't support boycotts, I like boycotts and Zach had the effect on me of getting me back into comic books hard where I had checked out because I just had no confidence that I could buy a story that I'd like because it all seemed like propaganda and he'd shown me comic books I could read and enjoy and as soon as I had that yes let's jump in let's buy it let's buy lots and lots and lots of it let's read it let's let's get the digital version and let's give it away to kids so that they can experience this amazing stuff too let's get new young fans interested in this let's donate it to libraries let's donate it to free reading piles let's donate it to kids at church and oh I'm so thrilled yet to be insulted makes it harder for me to to jump back in, to feel justified in jumping back in, so that I, I can understand the people who just want a straight boycott because they feel offended. They feel like they've been personally insulted and demeaned, and they don't have any other recourse than to withhold their dollar. I guess I just encourage you to think that a boycott is a more effective vote with your dollar than a boycott, because then Marvel knows what you like and what you don't like. You are voting with your dollar on the good comic book to tell Marvel, make more of this. If all you do is just boycott all of Marvel because of the ask me about my feminist agenda stuff, then Marvel doesn't know for sure why your dollar is withheld. So, okay, I've been going all over the place. I even kind of lost the thread of why you need to go outside <laughs> in talking about my Spider-Man fan fiction and my Dan Slott Twitter drama. So, uh, huh. I, I, I did say the kind of the whole point is going outside can prompt your imagination in strange ways. And I've talked about this in a few past videos that I'm connecting this with. My video on uh, the pros and cons of committing to the bit in response to Zach, I talked about the Impressionist and the Renaissance artists. So this is an illustration of me going outside like an Impressionist, appreciating nature like an Impressionist, and getting a spark that I couldn't have gotten if I'd stayed home in my studio all day, uh, but even though it's important to have a studio and work in your studio. Uh, it's related to getting human experience and understanding pathos in nature enough that you don't just have your little cubicle in Marvel in New York with a few progressive friends and you never go outside of it. You will start to experience interesting and amazing things outside that will be, inform your worldview and inform your work and make you better, even if it doesn't change your politics. Ha appreciating life and nature and the world around you will help. Like, like, if you tried to imagine a character moment for Spider-Man, would you ever imagine like a Spider-Man sitting down in a garden and seeing a spider's web fluttering in the wind and making an application to his life about that? Well, you, you probably, maybe you could imagine that if you were an imaginative genius, but going outside and seeing cool little things like that in nature can spark you and to go into directions you never thought you were going to go originally. So from Spider-Man waving into the wind, spider web waving into the wind, Spider-Man to the emotional ideas you could attach to things you see in nature and the stories you could tell about that to my own work, to Marvel Comics, to rudeness, rudeness on Twitter and getting outside your bubble. All the tangents. Summa, su I'm doing it again. Summa spoilerum, summa triggerum, summa tangentum. All the spoilers, all the triggers, all the tangents. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. Go outside and draw today, guys. And we don't worry, we will make Marvel great again. And you can make your comic. You can make your amazing thing that's in, inside your head. Uh, going outside will help you. It will help put to peace kind of that part of your brain that says you can't do it or you don't want to draw today or you don't have the capacity to do it or your drawing's too ugly. 
show me the comics you make because I want to see what you make because I believe that having a vision of the world where you are taking in as much as you can, reading as much as you can, listening to as much as you can, appreciating nature as much as you can, all of this is informing your imagination to, to help build your, there we go, Jack Kirby. Zach on Jack Kirby and calling Jack Kirby an imaginative genius. Yes, Zach Kirby was an imaginative genius, but even though I think there's truth to the idea that people can have amazing talents, they can be gifted with an ability to draw or they can be gifted with an ability to tell stories that you can't recreate. It's also true that you can work hard and develop habits that make you, a, make you a better artist or make you a better writer. And maybe you won't have Jack Kirby's imagination and maybe you won't have Sean Gordon Mur Murphy's talents, but you can develop the work habits that every good writer and every good artist needs to be successful and you can you can succeed even if you're not going to be da Vinci and even if you're not going to be Tolstoy you can develop your imagination to the point where you can make emotional and powerful and beautiful stories in spite of whatever quirks or flaws you may have I'm number one Marmaduke fan go go outside bring your sketchbook go create you can do this catch you later